Hi there, it's Scott Nicholson, Syracuse University School of Information Studies here at the Gaming Libraries and Course. Hi there, it's Scott Nicholson from Syracuse University School of Information Studies here with the Gaming and Libraries course. Today, Paul Wedsley is back again. He is going to talk with us about using strategies from gaming to better teach information literacy. So how do you take ways gamers learn in games and use that as a way to improve our teaching? It should be very interesting. Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Oshley, Information Literacy and Instruction Librarian at St. Norbert College. And today, I want to talk to you about games as teaching tools. Games employ a variety of educational strategies that can be good for us to think about in terms of our own teaching and how we structure classes, whether we're using games to teach or if we're just teaching in a, in a general environment. What we can learn from games as far as educational theory and strategies and how we can start incorporating some of those ideas uh, within, within our own lesson plans and instruction. First, let's look at games themselves in terms of what games incorporate, not in terms of play, but in terms of strategies and how they engage and motivate a player. That gaming has clear goals. There's clearly a goal of defeating a character or advancing a level and winning the game, finishing the story. The games provide us multiple opportunities to practice skills, whether that's a skill practice through a tutorial, whether that's a skill practice through repetition, but there's ways to practice those skills. Just like in a classroom setting, there should be ways to practice the skills that we're trying to teach. And games not only provide those opportunities to practice, but also provide monitored practice, that there's some feedback, that there's a continual feedback in a game, whether that's a game like uh, Guitar Hero, where you're getting Rock Band, where you're getting the, the level of how you're doing, whether that's your life bar, and if your life bar is going down, chances are you're not doing so well but there's some way that players are getting feedback as they're practicing those skill sets and those new abilities or the, the challenges that they're facing on each individual level. So that's uh, how games provide some of those opportunities for practice and, and, and feedback, constructive feedback, within that practice ability. In that same vein, games provide avenues for individual adjustment. That it is the same game is not the game for every player that a player sitting down to a game like Fable 2 or Fallout 3 where there's a lot of uh, potential decisions that are going on a new game that just came out uh, in May it, infamous for the PlayStation 3 uh, where you have a lot of dark light good bad choices that are going on that each player has the ability to, to change that and modify that uh, massive multiplayer online games there's a lot of individual adjustment that can go on so that every player is a little more nuanced and a little unique that every person sitting in our classroom has the ability to, to adjust that to their individual needs interests and desires so that it's not always the same experience but students players are getting what they need that there are teams a lot of collaboration teamwork. Uh, certain games require that to be successful. Uh, a game like Left 4 Dead from Valve where you're a group of four people going out zombie hunting um, works when there's a group of four people. Those are the only characters in or those are the characters in the game. They're not the only characters because you can have other people working as a team and being zombies trying to hunt down those other players. So there are there's a lot of collaboration and teamwork within that setting. Well, those opportunities for learning and experiencing. That also in addition to the individual adjustment and the teamwork, that there's a, the ability to produce something. That some games, like Little Big Planet, uh, and Sony PlayStation 3, where you're actually producing some of the levels, right? or you're downloading other player produced levels, so that there's, a, there's an element of being able to, to add something to the larger knowledge base, to the larger community. That within that, because of that, um, ability to add through production or the individual adjustment, there's a lot of personalization that can go on. Uh, the phenomenon of the, the Nintendo Wii's Miis and that whole personalization aspect, the avatar ability, that you can create something that is unique and you. All of these ideas, the individual adjustment, the practice of skills, the feedback, the, the personalization, the teamwork, all go into motivation that a player is continually motivated to keep advancing, to keep trying, even when they're not always succeeding, but to keep trying. 
And that not always succeeding part is a, is a key part in, in video games. The example here uh, of last year is Prince of Persia. Uh, in the screenshot, your, your uh, companion character is, is catching you and bringing you back up. But there's a number of, of difficult jumps and risky jumps that you take. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But the game provides a structure so that you're not always failing. That those jumps that you take, those risks that you take, there's a support structure to bring you back up and let you try again. That as we sit in a classroom and we wait for a student response, is there a fear of failure? Do we provide them with an with a environment that, that is full of infinite patience? Are we? Do we provide them a support structure to allow them to, to try, fail, and then try again? So there's a lot of good educational aspects that are going on within games already. And if we start thinking about those and thinking how we can begin applying those within our lessons, that doesn't mean that, that we have to create an electronic version of, of something in order to make it fun, in order to make it engaging and involving and motivating for our students. If we look at these examples and these concepts, we can begin applying them within our already, our standing classes, what we're already doing. It now becomes not necessarily adding in a new component or a new technology, but it's about modifying our teaching strategies. That games are effective because of how they incorporate these, that they don't just take one or the other, that they don't, they're not simply just, there's not a production aspect, and they don't provide just a lot of infinite patience and a lot of time to practice, but they incorporate that. There's the feedback, there's the teamwork, there's all these different components that go into games on a regular basis. And any game, there's a variety of these. And so if we think about that for our own lesson plans, we're not just picking and choosing one gaming strategy, but we're grabbing the host of these gaming strategies and applying them. Also, in terms of educational strategies, we can look at some of the strategies that, that G talked about in terms of, of how games teach and some of the good educational strategies within games. We have well-ordered problems, the scaffolding aspect that we continue to work into to our own teaching. Games do this continually as you're building on levels and new abilities. That there's a systematic thinking, that you're thinking of things in larger relationships and dynamics and, and processes rather than just isolated instances, that these things are, are interrelated. That there's a lot of interaction, and G talks about um, situated meaning, that the, the understanding of the context, the understanding of the concepts come through a larger context. Uh, Pokemon games are a great example of this with, with over 490 some Pokemon and all the different strengths and weaknesses of them. This isn't something that comes simply from the game, but there's a larger supportive community, whether it's guides and fans and online sites, in order to gain all that larger situated meaning. There's the idea of, of performance before competence, that we're throwing them in, allowing them to experiment a little, and then pulling them back and helping them understand what worked, what didn't work. As you think about tutorials within games, they throw you into a situation, they maybe give you a little bit to go on, and then let you play. But you begin to learn it through that, through that practice. And so rather than in a classroom setting, rather than simply telling them everything about a database or about a research process that we allow them to, we value their own experience and give them a context and a dialogue to be able to talk about that by letting them dive in and then pulling back to talk about what worked, what didn't work. And that idea of kind of exploring, thinking, and then rethinking uh, is a real key in terms of, uh, of creating engaging lessons and, and incorporating these video game strategies. G talks about just-in-time learning. Uh, tutorials do this a lot. There are some games where they pop up with a, a new skill set right when you need it. That we're not equipping our students with everything up front. And this is, this is hard to do if we're only seeing our students once a semester. You know. But the reality is we can't give them everything they need all in one city. And so rather than trying to throw everything at them, let's give them what they need when they need it give them pieces of it, and let them more richly develop those individual pieces rather than giving them all of everything and hoping that they retain it by the time they get to the end of the level in week 16 with the final, their final paper. We got the idea of, of pleasantly frustrating, that, that there's enough challenge there and enough incentive to keep moving forward. If we think about the motivation that we talked about before, that there should be a reason for them to do that. 
Uh, we talked about individual adjustment. G talks about it in terms of, of, of agency that's creating a sense of ownership. The game is like Fallout 3 or Fable 2 where your character is unique based on the, the choices you make, the positive and negative choices you make. But there's a lot of, a lot of ideas there in terms of just in time teaching, in terms of scaffolding and uh, thinking of it as a system and providing players, our students, with a context and some sense of ownership over that. So if we think about those, those gaming strategies from motivation and adjustment and personalization and scaffolding and systematic thinking, the performance before confidence of letting them toss them in and see what happens and pulling back and then giving them that just-in-time instruction, there's a lot of ways that we can use games and think about games as a model for, for good educational theory. And so here is just a, a starting of a list and I, I encourage you and challenge you to think about your own instruction or teaching in any type of, of classroom setting, whether that's continuing education or early childhood in a public library, school library setting or academic library setting. There's ways that we can use these gaming strategies to, to be more effective in engaging uh, with our patrons and students. Thank you, and hopefully this gets you thinking about some new ways to, to create and, and modify our own teaching strategies.